Okay, so uh, it's a generalization of classical knot theory, uh, and it can be described in a number of different ways. Let me begin by motivating the idea. <coughs> so I'm concerned with um, I'm concerned with knots in some surface cross the unit interval. Okay. Um, but I'm going to stabilize this, and you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. So this is this is embeddings of the circle into some surface cross I, um, or maybe disjoint unions of circles into a surface cross I. Uh, and if you begin to take a look at that just directly, take some surface and consider uh, some knot in the surface cross I, then among other things, you realize that you can draw diagrams for such things just as you drew diagrams in the plane, only of course you have to keep track of what happens uh, as you go around the surface. Or you could draw a diagram on an, uh, on an identification space for the surface and keep track of where the endpoints go and reconnect. Um, but let's consider this kind of diagram for a knot in SG cross I. So I can replace studying things like this with diagrams in the surface. That's the first observation. Um, and, then, and then you see that if you were going to study this um, in analogy to classical knot theory, but of course this is a, this is a special case of of knots in a three manifold, and it's a case of knots in a three manifold where we can actually do a lot, uh, and that's why I think this is interesting. Um, um, I haven't made a definition of virtuals yet, but you see that if you were thinking about this knot and you wanted to examine it in the surface. Uh, then you could do some of the things that you're already familiar with. For example, um, um, you, can, um, you can consider the uh, bracket polynomial. And you can consider it in the following way. You're, you're now talking about a diagram in the surface, and you're going to use the same uh, 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 skein expansion that you used for the bracket if you were looking at a planar diagram. Um, you can expand it like that um, and you can decide that if you have a curve like this next to a bit of diagram disjoint from it and this is a local curve, a local circle, then this is going to be equal to delta times k where uh, delta is equal to minus a squared minus a to the minus 2. Um, you could be, you have two choices though. It could be that you decide that you'll just keep it for a local circle, or you could decide any circle, any loop, um, one or the other, uh, because there's more structure here. Um, so for example, uh, if I were, if I were examining the bracket polynomial of this knot here, I could have smoothed this one this way and that one that way. Uh, and then I have one of the state circles that I'm looking at right there. Um, and I could say, well, I'll just, just, I'll just calculate the bracket in the usual way. I will assign it to uh, minus a squared minus a to the minus 2. And it certainly will be invariant under Reitermeister moves because of the same arguments that one made in the plane. They're all local. On the other hand, this curve, this curve is living on the, on the surface and has a non-trivial isotopy class on the surface. And if I'm examining knots in that surface, uh, then I could say I could take the isotopy class. So if I use local circles, uh, then I can uh, I can take uh, I can take um, I can then use isotopy classes for non-local circles. And, um, and then we could proceed to, to do lots of, uh, lots of investigations of knots in specific surfaces in that way, um, uh, where, of course, 
The knot theory that you're looking at, if you're looking at a specific surface, the knot theory, uh, the knot theory <coughs> includes homeomorphisms of the surface to itself in the sense that k prime equals h of k, and this is some homeomorphism uh, of the surface to itself, then k prime is regarded as equivalent to k. Okay, So uh, that, that uh, isn't, um, isn't uh, so important when you're looking in the plane or on the surface of the two-sphere because, the, because uh, there aren't homeomorphisms that are not isotopic to the identity. But here, uh, I can take a Dane twist. I can cut this. I can twist it by 2 pi and put it back together, and you'll get a rather different looking diagram. So, uh, so one would want to consider that as well. And, um, and as you see, there's an immediate quantum invariant, uh, the bracket polynomial, that you can study for uh, knots in surfaces. And one could go along in that direction without ever virtualizing anything but on the other hand there is the other uh, yeah, there is another thing that comes up here uh, that suggests doing something else and that is suppose that it was a higher genus surface but suppose that the knot isn't really living on the other handles or on some other handle uh, then this knot really in some moral sense is not a knot in the double torus it's really a knot in the torus and so I could allow stabilization in the sense that I am going to allow myself to find a curve which is disjoint from the diagram or disjoint from the embedding in the surface cross I and do surgery on that curve, cut it out and cut the curve out and replace uh, by disks and throw away the handle. Um, or, um, or more specifically, I would do surgery on this curve, cut it, and then put two disks in, and the handle is gone. So I could allow myself to do surgery on curves uh, and uh, consider stabilized knot theory. So there is. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, why is that compatible with this? I'm sorry? Why is that compatible with these large uh, people? Sorry, with these mapping fast. Uh. Ah, but let me explain what I mean by stabilized knot theory. So stabilized knots in surfaces is knots in surfaces up to this equivalence that I'm talking about here, right? Or, or you can think right moves on the diagrams and homeomorphisms modulo stabilization. So it's by definition that it's, uh, that it's compatible with it, right? Um, I'm allowed to do both things. Uh, I, I put my knot in a specific surface and I do its knot theory there. I may simplify it uh, or make it more complicated, do whatever I like to it. But then I notice that I can also do a surgery and get it into another surface, uh, a smaller surface perhaps. So I'm allowed to do that too. Okay, but intuitively, what does it mean? Because you, you said uh, it means uh, where it, it tells you where it lives, but it's not obvious to me that that's sort of unique. Uh, unique I'm not sure what you're worrying about. You could worry about. I'm not sure exactly. Let, let me let me let me put a question in your mouth, and you might agree that it's the question you're asking. Um, you, you could say to me, well, but. I know you could simplify the knot that way, but if you did it in some other way, there might be more than one way to do it. You have a knot in a surface of genus three, and you manage to push it around and get rid of, uh, get it off a handle, and then you did surgery on that handle, and now it's in genus two, and now you notice that you could even get it into genus one, and now you're stuck. You seem to be in the least genus. But what if you did it another way, and you got a knot in genus one? Uh, might it be a different knot? Or it might get stuck in genus two if you did. Or it might get stuck in genus two, but we're allowed to go up and down, all right? Um, but but the question is, how unique is the minimal genus knot that you would get out of such a uh, an equivalence relation? And the answer to that was given by Cooperberg. So Cooperberg, which Cooperberg? Greg Cooperberg. 
um, proved that the minimal genus representative for a given K diagram in SG uh, is unique. In the knob theory uh, of the minimal surface, so that includes homeomorphisms of the surface. Okay, um, so that uh, that is an answer to a question that I imagined you were asking. Yes, I'm not no, that is kind of the question I meant to ask. Uh, okay, yeah. So so this is a geometric theory, and uh, and as you see, this geometric theory can be uh, can be investigated. Um, um, without um, any extra diagrammatic apparatus um, by just thinking about knots in surfaces. And you put it in a given surface and work on its knot theory. And you look at the geometry of the situation, and maybe you can surge it and so on. And let me continue talking about it this way for a moment. Um, one of the things that you can do to replace the surgery is the following. Um, let's suppose we take the same knot that I was just looking at. And it's in the, maybe it's in a higher genus surface. Um, <coughs> but one way, <coughs> one way to get at, one way to get at um, a small genus surface, not necessarily the minimal one, uh, that that this knot is related to, is to take a neighborhood of it in that surface. So if you see a crossing, then um, you are going to form a ribbon neighborhood like this. All right. Uh, and if you see just a, an individual piece of diagram here, you're going to form a ribbon neighborhood like that. Uh, and so here, I would I would form that local neighborhood of the knot diagram sitting in the surface, right? And and then I can just cut that out. Um, I could cut that out, and then it has two boundary components, this one and that one. And I would add disks to the boundary components. And that gives me the tightest uh, surface that will hug that particular knot diagram. Now, of course, it might be that that's not the best, because the knot was, in fact, simplifiable, like this one is. And so everything I'm doing is a little bit um, futile, because I could have done a, an isotopy here and pulled it apart first. And then my neighborhood would just be an annulus instead of being genus 1. But, now, but if you think you have uh, 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 the least surface that you can make, then you can, you can do that and cut it out um, and, and add disks to its boundary. And that amounts to doing the surgeries you want. So another way of describing the surgeries from a diagrammatic point of view is that you take neighborhoods like this, and, uh, and then you are allowed to add disks or, or whatever you like to their boundaries. Uh, and that's the stabilization. So I per personally like to think of stabilization that way rather than worrying about the surgery. But if you want to prove Kuperberg's theorem, you need to think in terms of surgery and three dimensions in order to get a proof of it. Okay, so uh, so we have this theory, um, and um, and then what I want to point out about this theory is um, uh, in motivating what I call virtual knot theory is that um, there's a further diagrammatic move that you can make uh, that uh, that is useful. So if you were if we were back over here with the knot. And I were to project this um, into the plane, but excuse me, I'll put it up there so you can see it. Uh, then the picture that I would get in the plane would look like this.
and uh, I have two lines crossing one another, these two here, um, because of the projection. And that crossing is not a crossing in the diagram on the surface. It's a crossing that came as an artifact of projecting it into the plane. And so I will call that virtual. Um, and, and then uh, the question is, can you handle uh, this theory by just using diagrams with virtual crossings? And you can. Um, the answer is the following, uh, that um, if we use virtual crossings, and the rules, Reitermeister moves, as usual. What do I mean by that? I mean the usual Reitermeister moves from classical knob theory. plus detours, and a detour is the following. You have some consecutive sequence of virtual crossings like this, and maybe some other crossings in the diagram. This will be the, re the same as if you were to cut out that consecutive sequence and reroute it somewhere else, but if it had to lay down on diagram, then it gets virtual again. So you're allowed to do this whenever you please to the uh, picture, the diagrams in the pic, to the virtual crossings in the picture. So in the case of the knot that we were just looking at, we would have this virtual diagram, but I could just as well. Um, take this and run it somewhere else like that and make sure that these are all virtual. And that's equivalent to the original. Okay. And, um, and now if you think about what we were doing uh, in cutting the diagram out um, or, or bringing it back to a surface, you see that this makes sense, this extra equivalence. Let's consider again the matter of forming a neighborhood If I had a virtual diagram, how should I form a neighborhood of that? Well, the answer is this really was over that one side or, or disjoint from it, right? So let's leave it blank for a moment and form the neighborhood. So you see, the procedure is, for each virtual crossing, put in a ramp <coughs> to form the same excuse me, kind of ribbon neighborhood that we have formed before. And now you have put the knot on a surface in that way. It's an abstract surface. This is just a choice for illustration purposes, um, abstract-oriented surface. And, uh, and then you can add. Uh, disks to the boundary of this, and you will have it sitting on a torus. You'll reconstruct that. I don't care about the fact that you see a 360-degree twist in this band. That's, that's just uh, an artifact of the embedding picture that I drew. So that means that I can go back and forth. If I have a virtual diagram, I can put it on a surface. It won't necessarily be the least genus surface, but it will be the least genus surface for that diagram if I use disks for that diagram, but that diagram may have some freedom to move once it's on a surface or once it's in the plane according to these rules. So, um, so, it, uh, so it isn't necessarily obvious what the minimal representative is for a given virtual knot or a given uh, knot in this category. But the result of this construction is that um, this is called virtual knot theory. And this is equivalent to 
stabilized knots and surfaces. So you made a choice of which branch was going above which other branch in building that ramp? Uh, uh, I made a choice in drawing my picture. Right. Right. But, um, but I didn't change any orientation data about the surface. <clears throat> Excuse me. All I did was make a choice in drawing the ramp. I could have drawn it under. Yeah, it doesn't make any so the difference. the surface would be the same, but it would be embedded differently. Yeah, that's right. I, in order to illustrate things, I end up drawing embeddings in three space or the representatives for embeddings in three space, but uh, that's um, not part of the structure itself. Mm -hmm. So, so then we have this result, which is that a virtual knot theory in the combinatorial sense of diagrams and detour moves is the same as this geometrical uh, study of stabilized knots in thickened surfaces or stabilized diagrams in surfaces, and those can be studied. Uh, those can be studied by geometric means of the kind that I indicated there, or they can be studied by combinatorial means. Uh, by working with the diagrams, and that's what I'm going to talk about more today. Okay? Um, questions? Um, so, so let me see. Uh, the detours. Um, it's common sometimes you might see someone breaking down the detours into something um, more complex, because in fact you can. You can say, you can say instead of the detours. You can say that you will allow a flat right to move, a flat right to move, and another flat right to move. And Somebody like this. Now this one is the serious one. This is the this is an, an honest example of a detour across one crossing, uh, and the others, of course, are detours as well. Uh, and they're just uh, there because you would need them if instead of saying detour in a global way, you said local moves again. Uh, and these are the generating local move types. So, so that's useful um, in a lot of contexts. For example, one of the generalizations that you can make for knob theory that I'm not talking about today is virtual braid group. In the virtual braid group, you have braids as usual, but then you also have virtual crossings. And then in order to describe virtual braids, I need to tell you um, uh, what to do uh, about this as an element in the group. It's an element of order two. Um, it, um, it behaves just like a permutation, and it has some interrelationship with uh, regular braiding operators here. Uh, and so I would write them all out in, in this style, and I would have a set of generators and relations for the virtual braid group. So there it makes sense to do that rather than just talk about detour. Okay. Um, so, um, so how do we get some invariance here? I would like to prove, for example, that um, this is a non-trivial knot. And I want to show you a combinatorial type of proof here. So let's, let's label these crossings 1 and 2. And let me write down the, the, the flat Gauss code for this, by which I mean I'm going to walk along the diagram and say the crossings until I come back to where I started, say starting here. And I have 1 and then 2 and then 1 and then 2. And you notice that there are odd crossings in the sense that if you go from 1 to 1, you only meet one crossing in between. An odd number of crossings are met in between. Uh, and you see what happened there if you, uh, if you examine the trip you took, 1, and you came back to 1. 
and the reason why it was only one rather than two, as it would be in a classical diagram, is because there's a virtual crossing here, which I'm not counting. Uh, and so the uh, occurrence of virtual crossings can create odd parity in the crossings in the Gauss codes for these. And that's, um, that's one of the key things that gives rise to a lot of differences between virtual knots and ordinary knots. And uh, the simplest invariant that I can define is the following. I define signs of crossings in the usual way. So this is a, a crossing with a plus sign, and this is a crossing with a minus sign, sign of crossing. Um, that's just the usual convention. And then uh, in a classical knot, you have uh, the ride of the knot is equal to the sum of the signs of the crossings. And that's invariant under the second and third Reitermeister moves and comes up a lot when you're doing classical knot theory. Here, I'm going to define, at some point I called it J, I don't know why, JK to be equal to the sum over crossings that belong to odd crossings, that are odd, the sign of the crossing. Okay? So in this case, the one we started with had two positive crossings, and so J of this is 2. But I assert that J is invariant of virtual knot. Okay? So that means J is invariant under all the virtual moves, uh, including the detour. Is it clear? Uh, almost. I mean, some things are clear. Um, one thing is that uh, you know this is an even crossing, right? if you have a little curl. So the, the fact that the ride is not invariant under the first Reitermeister move is because you count that when you're taking the ride. But when you take the uh, odd ride here, you don't count it. So it does, it, it's invariant because you don't count it. Um, as for the second move, um, it's easy to see that one is plus and the other is minus in any case. Uh, and, um, and they might both be odd or they might both be even. You have to do a little parity check. And similarly here, there's a little bit of an exercise about what happens with the parity. And then you will see that, indeed, it's invariant. I leave the exercise to you. Um, and uh, you get uh, an easily proved uh, invariant uh, of virtual knots. And what properties does it have? I'm sorry? If, if you're at a crossing, there are two potential strands you can go along to come back. I'm have, not sure I got the question. Sorry, uh, what, why is the parity of the crossing well defined? Oh, um, um, even or odd? Um, I'll look at it this way. That you, you walk in the diagram and you come back to where you started, right? Um, and things are crossing through. Um, and maybe some of them are virtual. And, um, and if you, there are two trips that you can take. That's perhaps what you're worrying yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this trip and the other trip. But if you think about it a little bit, you'll see that the parity of those adds up to a total even parity. The parity that you get from this one and the parity from the other one. Great, because that's going around the entire. I mean, uh, I, c I can count a parity from this starting here and coming back to here, right? I count, you know, how many how many crossings did I go through? Self crossings, I go through them twice automatically. Um, crossings between, uh, um, I count them, right? Um, but there's the other trip, and if you and if you think about it a little bit, you'll see that the parities that you get from both trips add up to even. All right. Uh, and so it doesn't matter which trip you took. So like in this case, um, it's odd uh, between one and one inside, but it's also odd between one and one a lot around the 
of a part of the Gauss code. Or another way of thinking about it is the Gauss diagram. Maybe you like that better. Um, if, I, if I form the Gauss diagram, um, uh, then I'm just drawing it like this. Uh, and I have one, one, two, one, two. And I draw a chord from one to one and a chord from two to two to indicate the crossings. right? And then uh, the parity of a given crossing can be taken by definition to be the parity of the intersection number of, of the other chords with this chord. That's well defined from the outset, and you don't have to worry about which loop did you take it along. OK? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So, so then, as I said, there's a further exercise to check that it's invariant under 3. But then what do you have? You have that jk equals 0 if k is equivalent to a classical. And you have that jk star is minus jk, where k star is equal to the mirror image, by which I mean switch all the crossings, and you switch all the signs. So uh, you have this guy, k, and you have this other one, k star. Um, and so. And so we know that JK is 2, which means that this knot here is inequivalent to its mirror image, and it's not classical. There's no, no um, series of moves that will remove that virtual crossing and turn it into a classical diagram. Yeah? So from the virtual break group, it looks like that has a map to Z2, or the group algebra has a Z2 grading by the number of virtual crossings. Is that true? I uh, ask the question again. So uh, you define the virtual break group. Yes. Uh, it looks like that should be that should have a notion of Z2 parity by the number of virtual crossings. Mm -hmm. Is that related to the parity the, the thing I get by closing up the virtual braid? Well, there is the parity of the number of virtual crossings in a given knot or closure, right? Um, and you could ask, might as well ask, and look at the moves. What will happen uh, to just the number of virtual crossings if you do some moves on the knot? Well, so I guess I worry about the right of my right. Of one. Um, now, in the case of, of a knot, you can you can do things like this and um, and change the parity. Of the uh, number of the total number of cro of virtual crossings, so so it's not going to be an invariant, mm -hmm. right? On the on the other hand, uh, there is some strong parity thing going on if you're looking at linking, like here, uh, the fact that I have one only one crossing in this link means that it has a non-integral linking number. I have some a linking number one half. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are some aspects of that. But trying to uh, understand how the how the the appearance or, or disappearance of virtual crossings works is is sometimes subtle and sometimes leads to invariance. Uh, yeah. Um, so what do we have so far? Uh, we've we've gotten a lot out of very little. We've proved that this knot is non-trivial, non-classical, and so on. Um, but, but of course, there are other examples where you will have to do more work. Um, and let me see. I'll mention briefly another classical invariant and then come back to bracket. Was there a question? No? Okay. Yeah. Um, another classical invariant is the fundamental group, fundamental group of, of a knot in the three sphere complement, right? Um, and um, how do you do fundamental group here? Well, formally, you can do fundamental group. Or, of course, if you have the knot is embedded in a surface cross I, then you can consider the fundamental group of the surface cross I minus the, minus the, minus the knot. Right. You can consider that. Um, but then you have all the complexity of the surface itself. And 
um, and it's a little complicated to think about. So a simplification that's very natural is to, is to just use a Vertinger presentation, by which I mean we know that if we have a classical knot, then we can think of loops that go around the arcs in the diagram, and that there's a relation um, at each crossing of the form. A loop that goes around both of these it can be slid up and goes around both of these, and that gives rise to a relation of the form A times B is equal to B times C, or C is equal to B inverse AB. There is a relation at each crossing in the fundamental group of the knot where you think of the fundamental group as being generated by loops that come from base point and go once <laughs> around each of the arcs in the diagram, wording your presentation. So you can take that as a formal set of relations uh, 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 on the diagram, and you could, if you are going to be as simple-minded as possible, put no relation here, and then you get uh, a Vertinger presentation fundamental group for virtual knots. And um, it's interesting to think about it, but it's very weak. How weak? Take the same example that we were just looking at and think about what will happen to the Vertinger presentation of this. Um, you follow it along. Um, you start here, call that A. It's still A all the way around to here. And, um, and that means that this must also be A. Because if two out of the three at a crossing are equal, then the third is equal. And, and so it's all just Z. It's just Z. And that's the same as the um not. So, uh, so the fundamental group doesn't see things that are non-trivial very often. Um, and um, nevertheless, it's, it's an invariant that's available. And I wanted to mention one way that I think is very interesting to um, make that stronger. Uh, that has some conjectures about it. So instead of this, you can do the following. You still have generators A and B, but when you go through the virtual crossing, then you, um, oh, let me, uh, excuse me, let me just write this as A to the B, okay? Um, and let me write a to the B bar as B A B inverse. Okay? Saves me bother. So now I'm going to say that this will be B to the V for some from extra generator V, free generator, and this will be A to the V bar. So I measure the virtual crossing and I have a group G, okay? <coughs> which is generated by A and B and so on, and also this extra free generator V and the relations. So it's the same V for all the virtual processes? Same V, one V, right. So it's just an, kind of an automorphism that you put in. And, um, and you can check that this is, this group is an invariant of virtual knots. Now here we're using the combinatorics in a way that I don't know how to interpret well in any other language than this particular one. And this seems very strong. Um, you can uh, have some fun checking that uh, that knot we've been drawing is non-trivial with this group. Um, it's related to some polynomial invariants that I won't mention for lack of time. Um, and it's um, not unreasonable to conjecture that G of K detects the unknotted virtual. In particular, uh, Valery Bartikoff and, um, and Yulia uh, Mokoshima uh, did check it for 
one famous example that is very hard to check uh, by other means. I'll tell you the example, and then we'll do something else. But um, this is a famous example that's nice to know about. Now this virtual knot is a connected sum, as you see here, uh, of uh, unknots. So that's one reason for mentioning the example because of this phenomenon, right? This is unknotted. But you can take the connected sum of some unknots and get non-trivial knots. And, um, and this um, has trivial Verdinger group and it has trivial Jones polynomial in the usual sense which I'll mention in a moment. And uh, many other invariants fail on it. Um, and on, on the other hand, they worked very hard and they showed that this group does see it. So that's some evidence for the conjecture that it detects the unknot. So there may be a group that detects the unknotted virtual. Um, and um, that's all I want to say about that. Let's talk about the Jones polynomial some more. So here's the Jones polynomial. As I described it in diagrams on surfaces, but I'm going to describe it the same way for virtual diagrams. Only the simplest Jones polynomial, and again, for the same reasons as before, I can make it more complicated, but this is any loop. All right, um, and this is for virtual knot theory Jones polynomial. This is the simplest Jones polynomial, bracket polynomial I can make for virtual knots. So um, what will that look like? Uh, for example, suppose that you have this link, then it would be A times this plus A inverse times that. And uh, each of these is going to, by the usual convention, which I forgot to mention, that I like to just set it equal to 1 on an isolated loop. This is equal to A plus A inverse. And the uh, and the, and the bracket polynomial is detecting the linkedness of that. And, and you can continue in that fashion, and you have a bracket polynomial. Um, now, again, this is the simplest kind of generalization of a known invariant, and it has some weaknesses. But this weakness is, and it leads to very interesting problems. So let me show you the weakness. The weakness is the following formula. that it does not see the appearance of flanking virtual crossings on either side of a crossing. You can erase them. Why? Um, well, let's look at the proof. If you expand this, then you are looking at this plus this. And those reduce to pulled apart by detour and flattened out. And that's just the expansion for this. So it doesn't see that. So what? Well, let's do an example. according to what I just said.
I just copied it first. So these are the same, but according to what I just said, I could remove this in this fashion and remove this in this fashion, and I get the same result. So the bracket of this is the bracket of this, and this is an unknot. Um, I'll just pull it up a little bit for you. Um, and so that implies that the Jones polynomial of this knot is equal to 1, where by Jones polynomial I mean the normalized bracket. Okay, so, um, so I have a knot with Jones polynomial equal to 1, and it's virtual, and now I have some, it's telling me I have more work to do because I need to prove uh, either that it could be turned into a classical knot, and then I'd be very happy because I would have a classical knot with Jones polynomial 1, unlikely, <coughs> <coughs> Or I need to prove that this is, in fact, not classical. Now, if I try to prove that it's not classical, then the first thing I might think of is to examine the code. But what is the code for this one? One, two, three. One, two, three. And there aren't any odd crossings in that uh, example. So I can't use the code. I can't use parity. I have to use something else. I can't use that kind of parity anyway. Um, and, um, and, so, um, and so that leads to searching for other kinds of invariants. Um, and furthermore, before uh, showing you any other invariants, this construction isn't just one example. It's infinitely many examples because of the following. Think about how I made it. I start with a crossing like that. And instead of drawing that crossing, I go virtually through and back under and then virtually through. And I'll call this operation virtualization. All right. Uh, now, uh, according, this has the same bracket as, I'll draw it again. has the same bracket as this. By the result we proved. And uh, this can be straightened out like that. And you see it's the switch of the original crossing. So I can start with the crossing in the diagram, like I could take a trefoil knot diagram. And I could, um, I could take th that crossing, and I could say, instead of leaving it as it is, I'm going to virtualize it. And virtualizing it means that I draw the diagram that I had before, but instead of going down through, I, virtual, I, I go virtually across, go back through in the other direction, changing the orientation, the sign of that crossing, and put in these two virtual crossings. So I end up over here. But this has the same. Uh, uh, bracket polynomial as this, and that turned out to be the unknot. And of course, it turned out to be the unknot because, in fact, it was the result of switching that crossing. So, so you see, uh, <clears throat> didn't switch it, did I? Um, switching the crossing. So. Um, so if I wish to make some uh, virtual knots with, with unit Jones polynomial, I just take my favorite <coughs> classical knot and find some crossings in it that I can switch, switch them. But instead of switching them, I virtualize them, and I have a virtual knot with unit Jones polynomial. And an exa and examination of, a, of some fundamental group thing, which I won't bother you with, um, I thought I'd stop at three because there are other talks that are going on today that somebody might want to go to. So I'll, I'm going to take that discipline and stop at three. Um, uh, so where are we? Um, we can produce infinitely many uh, examples of this type. It's, uh, it's a bit of, uh, of algebra to check, algebra and a theorem uh, about, uh, about the way the fundamental group of classical knots behave that tells you that these are non-trivial. 
Not that they're non-classical, but they're all non-trivial. So I take any classical knot that's non-trivial, and I make um, knots out of it that are uh, have unit Jones polynomial. And um, um, you can invent various invariants that will detect this, but any invariant that you detect that's more or less like one of those polynomial type invariants, um, it has its own has its limitations. And there will be examples of this type that it doesn't see. Um, so how to prove that the entire range of them are all non-classical? Um, well, um, some time went by. I think the problem, uh, the problem really occurred to us before, uh, long, quite a long time before Kronheimer and Morovka proved that Kovana homology detects the unknot. And maybe, and certainly before we had a, a version of Kovana homology that was good for virtuals. But Montura found a good version of Kovana homology for virtuals that extends the standard Kovana homology for ordinary knots. And it is known that uh, Kovana homology for classical knots detects the unknot. If you put those together and the fact that the Kovana homology that we have for virtuals does not see this either, then you can see easily that these all have to be non-classical. Because if it were classical, it would be a non-trivial knot that had trivial Kovana homology that doesn't exist. So by using Kovana homology, we get a proof that this infinite set of examples are in fact all non-classical. And um, and, and nevertheless, uh, when it comes to actually calculating what's really going on with any given one of them, uh, it's uh, a matter of does this invariant that I happen to know work well or does it not work well? So I was going to tell you about an example of an invariant that I can use to detect this, but since we only have a few minutes, I want to shift to uh, another aspect of these things that is worth talking about, and that is... Some, um, when you say non-classical, you mean you can't remove all the virtual crossings? I'm, when I say non-classical, I mean that um, you're allowed to do virtual moves on this, but no matter what you do, there will always be virtual crossings. Or another way of putting it is non-classical means that its minimal genus is greater than zero. Sorry? So the fact that you have these infinite number of examples which all have Jones polynomial 1 or Kovano, trivial Kovano homology, does that make them virtual somehow? Or it's just the virtual crossings? Well, um, you, you have this example, and you have that the, the Kovano homology of this example is trivial. And if k is equivalent to uh, k prime classical, uh, then that would imply that the Kovanov homology of k prime, and now this is virtual Kovanov homology, but this is classical, because when you do the virtual Kovanov homology on a classical, it's classical. Uh, is trivial, and that implies that k prime is unknotted, right? Uh, and that implies that k is unknotted because the unknotting just goes, you move it until it's classical, and then, and then as a classical knot, it's unknotted. But we know, we know that k is non-trivial to begin with. We do know that. We just don't know whether the non-triviality adheres in the classical world or not, but we do know it's non-trivial by construction. Uh, yes, I, I think my, maybe my question is whether this sort of virtualization is the only thing that, whether you expect that this virtualization is the only thing that the Kovano homology doesn't see oh, or something um, like that. 
No, there probably are other things that it, well, it doesn't see mutation. It doesn't see various things. But if mutations and flights that involve virtual crossings, I don't know what all the relations might be. Right. So that's an open question. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, was it the level yeah. of? Yeah. Name? So, um, so maybe I should say one more word about this. This construction, um, the <coughs> if you have A and B, and then you have an A to the B, <coughs> um, and you do it on unoriented diagrams, there are algebraic things that are like the Verdinger presentation group, okay? Um, like that, um, but they're, they're defined on unoriented diagrams. Um, and an example of such a thing for classicals is A to the B is equal to B A inverse B. That turns out to be the fundamental group of the twofold branch covering along K for classicals, and it detects the unknown. Okay? So there is a, a kind of fundamental group. It's really the fundamental group of the twofold branch covering. It can be described this way. No, nothing happens on virtual crossings. Okay? Now you can define that on virtuals as well. So then what will happen? Um, if I, if I uh, started here and I called this A and this one B, then this would come out A to the B. What will happen when I do this construction? This is still A and B. We're replacing it in the diagram. Um, A is here, B is here, and this is A to the B, and then it comes through here and comes out A to the B, and B uh, just slides along and comes out here, and, um, um, and you see that there, this does not disturb the relation at the crossing when you do this construction. So that means that if this group here was detecting an, uh, was was detecting that something is not is knotted, then you get an isomorphic group over here, the same group, uh, uh, and consequently, this if this knot is knotted, then this one will be knotted. So that's how I know that that when I perform this construction, the results are definitely knotted. But they have trivial Jones bone only. Okay. So, um, so the other topic, which we only have a minute or two to talk about, <coughs> is the one that's closer to physics. Although I was hoping that you would look at this and then it would occur to you that it was related to physics in one way or another that I never thought of, and maybe it does. But, um, but you know that we have quantum link invariants, and quantum link invariants are, are obtained by using operators like this would be a solution to the Yang-Baxter equation. And let's be concrete, it's some matrix uh, of, uh, of vertex weights like that, um, where I'm thinking of a statistical mechanics model with labels on the edges. And there will also be uh, some uh, 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 operators on cups and caps in the diagram, and the diagram is set up. Um, there are more, there's more than one way of doing these things, of course, but the diagram is set up like this in Morse form, so it's a categorical composition of cups, caps, and crossings like that, and you can think of the evaluation of it as a statistical mechanics sum with these vertex weights, including these special vertex weights. Um, and then what will happen if you, um, if you know that it's okay for Reitermeister 2 and Reitermeister 3, and you ignore this, that's what you usually do, uh, for classical knots, can you generalize it to virtual knots? And the answer is, well, I can try. What if I, for example, try doing this to this? So this would just be a permutation across identity, chronic or delta here. Um, I could do that. Um, meaning that the labels just continue across the virtual crossing. Uh, 
and then uh, um, almost everything will continue to verify, but there is one problem, and that problem is this guy, because as you see, this is equal by that definition to MBA, the transpose of M, and <coughs> And so, and so, this this new statistical mechanics sum, uh, where I include the virtual crossings, will not be invariant under under this, which is kind of similar to not being invariant under this, but of a different character. Um, uh, this often is some local multiplication, and this has to do with the rotation number of the curve often. So, um, so, what the, so the result of this is that you can generalize any quantum link invariant to virtual knot invariant as long as you um, uh, don't ask it to be invariant under the first virtual flat move, which I call rotational virtuals. And uh, if you like to summarize, you can think of it as the detour move now must be a regular homotopy in the plane so that those little curls can't be removed. Um, and, um, and so quantum link invariance <coughs> extend to rotational virtuals, which means that's not allowed and this is not allowed, but you can normalize it away. But the other one isn't a matter of normalizing it away. It's just a different theory. For example, um, here's a nice non-trivial rotational virtual knot. See, that nobody, I didn't mention forbidden move, but you, there's nothing that says that you can move uh, that you can detour classical crossings across virtual crossings, and you can't. Uh, and um, so I've got this one stuck between two, and this won't disappear. And you can prove that this is non-trivial, uh, even using a, a quantum invariant. So there are lots and lots of quantum invariants of this rotational virtual category. And it's interesting to look at quantum invariants from that point of view, to see some things about the limitations of quantum invariance, because um, you know you can set up a certain category of quantum invariance, like I did in a paper using Hopf algebra invariance, and then see that um, there are some examples that will never be seen by those invariants because of the way the formal properties of that category of diagrams interacts with the invariants. So it gives you, a, it gives you a, a field of statistical mechanics models to play with in relation to um, yang baxter equation and so on. And so there may be some physics there. And in any case, it's relatively unexplored. There's, it's also the case that uh, in some cases, you can adjust things so that it is an invariant of virtuals. So this can be done for the Alexander polynomial, for example, a variant of the Alexander polynomial. And if I'm not mistaken, one knows in principle that there ought to be a virtual Homfle polynomial because you can add virtual crossings to kovana frozanski homology. Um, now, I may be mistaken there. Uh, because I'm not a, an expert on kovana frozanski homology, but I think that's the case. But then that would mean you would take the graded Euler characteristic polynomial, and we don't know a, a nice description of that combinatorially. So if it is true what I just said, it's still very far from being realized in, a, in an understandable way. So this is a, a short description of some of the things that happen in virtual knot theory, and um, I'll stop here. And if it occurs to you that this is related to some ideas that you've been thinking about, please let me know. Are there any questions? Do you know of any work interpreting this in transcendence? You, you mentioned, sorry, do you know of any work that interprets this in the context of transcendence theory? Hmm. No. 
Okay. I mean, um, you mentioned physics, but this is sort of a very limited context um, of physics. Certainly, we could do churn Simon's theory in a thickened surface. But then you are handling the topology of that surface along with everything else. And this game is uh, designed to ignore all of that. So I don't know, and I don't know how to do that kind of, I don't know how to create that kind of ignorance. Good question, though. There are, of course, Vasiliev invariants in there if you want to look at them. This is, it's three dimensional only if it's SG times I, right? These virtual knot diagrams yeah. are kind of three dimensional when you think about them as coming from SG times I, right? Or I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by they are three dimensional. I mean, yeah, I don't know, but. <clears throat> I was trying to think of the other realization in topological strings. You take a conormal of the knot in S3. I mean, you could ask what changes for the Lagrangian if you take the conormal of such a virtual knot, but then you'd have to get that in S3 in the first place. I don't see what happens to your virtual crossings in S3. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I make it geometrical by lifting the virtual crossing into the surface. Now, um, if you wish to lift it cheaply, you can always do this. Here, here's the virtual crossing. And you say, well, I think I'll just take the plane and I'll put a handle on the plane here. And I'll run this one up through the handle and the other one that way. And that puts it on a surface. It just doesn't put it on the, on the tightest surface you could make. But you can always think of it as detouring up into another dimension like that. So you'll notice that um, it does lead, there is an intuitive idea here which might be worth following somehow. You imagine knots in three dimensional space which every once in a while detour up into some higher dimension and then they come back down into three space like a phenomenological string might if it was floating up into the higher dimensional manifold. Um, but if you try to formalize that in three space, then it's not obvious what you mean at all. Uh, if you said, well, sometimes it goes away and comes back. Whereas in the plane, um, uh, it's formalized in these planar diagrams. You know what you mean by uh, detour and what you meant by uh, it disappears here and reappears there. So. If I said to you, here's my favorite virtual knot, and um, these two are virtually connected. Well, that's fine. Uh, that just means I know what I mean by it. You can connect them any way you like with virtual crossings. It'll be equivalent. So it's formalized. The idea of disappearing and reappearing is formalized in a plane, but it isn't well formalized in three space. But there are things that are related to higher dimensional space that happen here. And so maybe I should mention this just for the sake of, um, uh, of uh, free association. Um, Shin Sato had the following idea that um, he would associate to a virtual crossing and a real crossing, some tubes in four space. And in this case, the tubes ignore one another. So when I draw one tube underneath the other in four space, uh, it just means that they ignore one another, and when you took the three-space projection, you got that or the other one. It doesn't matter. So it's independent of the crossing. And what about this? Well, this means that um, that one of them um, goes through the other. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is 
In, in a space-time picture of it, I mean that as this one is going this way in time, this one is coming up through that one like that going through the middle of it so that there's one time slice where that one of them is exactly in between the inside the other one and then it continues on over here and this one continues on over there like that. So they're linking like that. So the crossing is a, is a jump inside and duck out uh, picture uh, and the other one is an ignore it and so he has a mapping which takes uh, Shin, Shin's mapping takes uh, virtual diagrams to uh, two tubes or tori in four space. And then it turns out that it really should go by virtual diagrams modulo certain equivalence relation and then there's an unsolved problem about whether this and the isotopy classes of those story are the same. So the ambiguity of, uh, of the virtual crossing can be imaged in a force space phenomenon that way. Further questions? Let's thank Lou again.